So thankful that you're here with us today. Thanks for coming in. I'd like you to find yourselves a seat. Uh, we are here to worship. We worship our Lord, our Savior. And uh, we're going to do a couple of songs and start things off just to get us, uh, get the blood sort of moving, the hands clapping. It's all all right. And we're going to worship our awesome God. We want to worship in wonder and uh, be drawn near to him. Let's stand together to be a church as we worship our awesome God together.
leads to nothing that stands your inside. So no matter what it is that you're going through, know that you can stand firm. At the name of Jesus, the devil has to flee. Every time. Well, we've been deceived by the devil too long. We're gonna turn the devil's kingdom down. What is said was his, and all is all in all. We're gonna turn the devil's kingdom down. Let's go.
Well, Bible Adventure, you guys can go and be seated. Bible Adventure Camp starting soon, believe it or not. This year's theme is treasure. We are treasured by God. I'm going to invite our dance team to come on up. And they are going to share the theme song from this year's Bible Adventure Camp. Sometimes it's like, yes, I get to drop the kids off, and then 
get to go and get some shopping done or whatever else. And, and we, we're really asking for this year, those are some nice times. They're great times to use and your kids are being blessed. But uh, families, this year is such an incredible time for us to gather together as families to do this and not just for you, all right? We have kids who come every year who have no church affiliation whatsoever. They have never heard about Jesus. Their families do not worship Jesus. And now they're asking their parents are going to stay and go through this with them. And not only are these their kids going to hear the gospel, the parents are going to hear the gospel too. Because if a kid comes to know Jesus, who's going to bring him to church? We need their parents to know Jesus as well. Amen. So we invite you to come and be a part of this because we want not just kids coming to know Jesus. We want families coming to know Jesus because we want these kids growing up, being brought to church, being brought to places where they are going to continue to learn and grow in their faith. So please come and be a part of this. Try out something new here this year at our, at our family Bible Adventure Camp. So with that, welcome. <coughs> Everybody, it's great to have you here today. It's great to be worshiping and celebrating with you. We do want to say that for all of our kids from ages three years old up through first grade, at this point, you guys are dismissed to head out to Children's Church, heading over to the West Modular Building. So you guys can head out there. For our kids who are six years old through sixth grade, uh, you can, if you haven't grabbed it yet, grab your Treasure Seekers page. If you're visiting, that is for the kids to take their own sermon notes, and you can grab those sheets out in the foyer over here. Uh, so with that, we just want you to know, church, we love being here with you. It is great. It is, And this is an exciting day as we get to celebrate our seniors who are going to be going off in a little bit, and, and that is a wonderful time. But as a church, we, we know... We get to celebrate things, but not all of life is a celebration. And we want to be here to pray for you, to care for you, to continue to, to walk with you through everything. So on the table back by the, by the media booth, or if you're in the upper room back by the doors where you came in, there's a white table there. And there's a card on there that, that uh, just says prayer requests on it. There's space for you to fill out whatever is going on in your life that you need prayer for this week. Or people you know and love, because we want to be praying for you. We want to be praying with you throughout the week. On that table is also a card that says welcome. If you're visiting with us, we invite you to fill out that card so that we can connect with you. And it gives us the ability to help plug you into other places of ministry in the church to find out places that you can join with to continue to grow, be growing to be a disciple of Jesus. So finally on that table is a receptacle for those cards as well as for your tithes and offerings as we give each week. So with that, let's take a moment and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for the good work that you do, that you are doing in our lives. We thank you, Jesus, for the treasures that we have in this church, for our kids who are growing to know you. And Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would continue to plant your word to you in their hearts, that they would know you, that they would love you, God, and that when they have grown, that they will not leave from you, but will continue to follow you faithfully. God, we thank you for our teens who we get to celebrate today who are graduating and will be moving on to new things. Lord, would you would your spirit speak to their hearts, continue to, to hold them close, to put a hedge of protection around them that keeps them from the evil of this world and allows them to focus their hearts and their minds and their lives on you. Father, lastly, we thank you for the gifts of this church, for the generosity. We ask that you would bless each of those who give today. And would you be glorified and praised uh, throughout the world with these gifts, God, that you would use them for your glory, Jesus. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, good morning. This is Marlon. Laramie County is among the highest in the nation per capita for those experiencing suicide. We want to be prepared to minister to them. So we are having a suicide prevention training day, June 5th. It will be two sessions, 8.30 to 10 and 10.30 to noon. We would like for you to register by going to office at CheyenneAlliance.org. Be sure to indicate which session you would like to be part of. The nice thing for you is that all costs have been defrayed because of the donor. So we really want you to be prepared in learning more about ministering to this need in our community. Thank you. Bible Adventure Camp is almost here. 
June 22 to 24 are the dates, and although that's still over a month away, it's going to be here before we know it. Now, Bible Adventure Camp always takes a large number of people coming together to help serve, and one of those things is that in the foyer, we have a board full of sticky notes, and on each note card is an item that is needed for Bible Adventure Camp. If you would please go on out there, take a look at their board. If there are some things that you can supply, grab that sticky note off the board, get the item, and bring it back to the box that's underneath the board there. Also, we want to invite you families, because Bible Adventure Camp is for families this year, please register online for Bible Adventure Camp. We'd love to have you here. Invite your friends and neighbors and others around you to come and be a part of this as well. Finally, if you are from middle school up through adult and you want to be a part of helping out but haven't signed up yet, please talk to Julie Taylor so you can be on the team for Bible Adventure Camp. The end of the school year is rapidly approaching, and with that, as a church, we want to promote our children from the grade they're in to the grade they're going to. So, Sunday, May 30th, there are going to be no Bible communities that morning. Instead, we are going to have our, te our, our teacher appreciation and promotion Sunday celebration during our Bible community time. So come and join us in the fellowship hall for a breakfast burrito breakfast provided by our youth as they continue to raise funds for their activities this summer. And a morning of celebrating our teachers and our children and the things that they have grown. And speaking of promotion, I want to invite uh, our youth director, David Weiss, uh, and our uh, graduates on up to the stage as we get to hear from you guys today uh, and uh, your promotion from uh, children to adults. Woo! <laughs> Good morning. I'm, I'm glad uh, I got everybody up here now. First service, I could tell you that our Katea wasn't here, and I totally spaced talking about her at first service. But everybody knows it. I can't believe Bentley let me forget to talk about her. I'm surprised he wasn't yelling from the back row. Anyways, these are our graduates this year. Um, we couldn't be more blessed as a church to have these guys representing us. I've been on mission trips and and life and stuff with most of them and. Um, it's just been a good time with these guys. They're, they're good leaders. Um, I look forward to what God has in store for them in the future and what their plans are. Um, you guys are going to hear from them. But, uh, man, the message this morning was just spot on for these guys with all the stuff that's out there that can uh, kind of get in their way. So they can get in their way of uh, what they got going on. So just remember these guys as prayer points. Um, when, uh, when you're doing your daily prayers, remember them as they go off because they're not going to be with mom and dad anymore. They're going to be off at the colleges and kind of making their own decisions. And, and so just keep them in your prayers. You know, keep our youth group in general in your prayers, but these guys especially as they step out. But I, I know you guys want to hear from them, so I'm just going to hand the mic to Shannon and let her pass it on down this way. She'll tell you what she's got planned for next year. All right. I'm Shannon again. Um, and so next year I'm going to Simpson University in Redding, California um, to study nursing and I hope to become a pediatric nurse. So, yippee. Woo! I'll be attending the New York Institute of Art and Design online in August to get my certificate in interior design. Northwestern College at Barnes City, Iowa, where I'll play football and wrestle, and then I'll be studying secondary education with endorsement in history. Uh, I'm Connor, and I'm going um, to Montana Tech to study power line construction and maintenance technology in August. Service again. I, I love on these guys, but there's there's 
one of the elders that I know, uh, I'm sure all the elders do, but there's one that's always outspoken about our youth, about uh, whether it's all the way down at the preschool age or all the way up to the high school kids. Um, that would be Lester Lavallee, and I'd like Lester to come up and, uh, and pray for me. Yes, amen. You know, um, church, y'all know, you know, these are our babies. I know they're practically grown now, but <laughs> we love y'all so much in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You know, there's nothing wrong with a second anointing. They just got anointed three times. <laughs> Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, we come again, Lord God, thanking you, Father, for your anointing on these young people, mature people in Christ. We thank you, Father, for your blessings upon them spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially. We thank you, Father God, for your keeping them, Lord God, by the power of the Holy Spirit that is able to empower them to do all things in Christ in the way that you lead and guide them, Father God. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for how you love them, and you love them more than we love them. Lord God, we thank you for your touch upon their lives as you're leading God them into higher heights in you, vertically, Lord God, and doing what they've been called to do, Father, to do great things for you, Lord God. Oh, to help save souls, to be witnesses, Lord God, to be light in this world. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, Father, for their parents who is so proud of them as we are. Thank you, Father. Blessings upon them all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you have all your things, your notepads, your Bible, your nameplate. And real quick, I'd just like to thank all my, uh, the people that helped me with youth group, from Melody to Cassie to, to Arnold, and DJ. You guys were huge. I uh, couldn't do it without you. Thank you, guys. Church, we invite the priest to come up and uh, you know what, what a beautiful thing. You know, God's blessed us with uh, just wonderful families and, and wonderful children and young adults, and, and every year we get to pray over uh, our high school graduates and, and they just get to see. It's so fun uh, to see when they come back. I know we got Sarah back there. Back, she just graduated college. It's just, it's, it's just amazing. And um, I know this is a praying church. We always say prayers and prayer to work with the people of God. We need to continue to be praying for our students as they go off. And as long as you guys keep Jesus as the center, you're going to go far. Amen. You're going to go far. Amen. And uh, you know, we need to, um, in all of our ways, acknowledge the Lord. And he will make our paths straight. And this is true for everybody. So we're going to sing a song that just speaks about keeping Jesus at the center um, as before moving into God's word. And, and church, uh, this is just a reminder. That it's in Jesus and Jesus alone. And as we keep him centered in our life, we can actually live life the way it's supposed to be. In relationship to the Father and in a relationship to other people. We love the Lord our God of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And our neighbors as ourselves. And we can only do that through Jesus. Let's continue worship. Yeah. 
and all truth, the Holy Spirit. Continue to mold us, to make us more like you, for your glory and your purpose. We praise you and thank you. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I invite you to go ahead and be seated. It is so good to be gathered together at God's house, with God's people, listening to God's word. It's all about the Lord, and what we get to do here each and every Sunday is such a blessing. Such a blessing. You know, I remember the very first time that I went skiing. I was in high school at the time, and I had just recently moved. I grew up in South Chicago, and so we didn't have a lot of skiing opportunities there. We moved to Western Montana, and so some friends of mine, um, they decided to take me skiing. I thought, well, I'll give this a try. And I figured it would be rather easy. I mean, after all, as I was putting on all of my ski equipment, I could see these little kids just zipping up and down the mountainside like nobody's business. I was 16. I was fairly athletic. I figured, no problem, right? Piece of cake. Well, not really. I learned rather quickly that skiing is not so easy. I spent a good deal of time laying in the snow that day. And perhaps the most embarrassing moment was when I wiped out the entire line that was waiting for the tow rope because I couldn't stop. And thankfully, I, no one probably even knows it. If you were there that day, I apologize now. But I'm hoping that uh, nobody remembers who I was. You know, fortunately, I've gotten a little better over the years, although I haven't done a lot of skiing in the last decade or so. I'm busy doing other things. But isn't that the way things work? Often, we look at something and we figure that we have it all figured out. It's really rather easy. But then we begin to really look into it or we begin to put it into practice and we realize rather quickly that it's not so easy after all. Can't life be that way so often? You know, as we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount in the last couple weeks especially, last week and this week, I wonder if that's the way that the people felt who were listening to Jesus teach during the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, during the message from last week, we saw that Jesus began to teach on the command that we're not supposed to murder anybody. And I'm sure that the people all thought, well, we're all pretty good at not murdering. However, they quickly saw that actually it's unresolved anger that's just as much sin and that keeping the command was actually much harder than it initially appeared. Today, Jesus is going to be teaching on adultery. And, and again, I'm sure that the people began to breathe a sigh of relief because not committing adultery overall, I mean, it's a relatively easy command to keep. However, just like last time, there is much more there than initially meets the eye. Today we're going to talk about the sin of inappropriate desire. Now, just as in last week's sermon, the previous sermon, we read Jesus, he starts off by saying, you have heard it said, but I tell you. And so through these series of teachings, what Jesus is doing is he's looking at Old Testament law, specifically the Ten Commandments, and then he's letting us know what the heart of the law is really all about. That's what it is that's going on here in this message. Jesus is, is looking at the heart of the law and letting us know what it really is all about. You have heard it said, but I tell you, we see that same formula right here beginning in, the, in verses 27 and 28. Listen first to verse 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Well, Jesus is quoting Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. He's reminding the hearers of the command that you should not commit adultery. Now, adultery itself is a very specific sin. It is a marital sin. Adultery is physical relations between a married person and somebody other than that person's spouse. There's not a lot of ambiguity about what adultery is or isn't. It's very clear that it is wrong. It is a clear breach of God's command. Married people are not to be committing adultery, period, end of story. Now, just like last week, we're going to see that Jesus, he gets into the intent of the law and not just the command itself. 
I just mentioned, I believe that when Jesus began to teach on murder or to teach on adultery, that people began to breathe a little sigh of relief because this was relatively easy stuff. I mean, if I do not murder somebody and I do not commit adultery, well, then I must be doing just fine as far as God's concerned. In fact, that in and of itself, not murdering and not adulterating, I guess that's really rather easy. There are many, many people who have gone through their life without murdering anybody or without committing adultery. However, just like last week, we're going to see that keeping this command is not so easy. Listen to verse 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow. That changes the dynamic quite a bit. With this simple statement, Jesus is letting his hearers know that adultery is much more than just a physical act. It is much more than just a physical act. Do not think that you have preserved your virtue by simply avoiding an action. And that's true for any action, really, for any command. Don't think that you've preserved yourself as virtuous by simply just avoiding this specific action. Because you see, your heart can be corrupted quicker than your body. Amen. Let's just take a few moments and talk about what it is that this looks like, specifically in the area of adultery, since that is what Jesus is addressing here, adultery and lust. Now, the text says that if that anybody who looks at a woman lustfully, is committing adultery in his heart, and therefore it is sin. Understand that the same applies for women as well. This is not just a guy thing. Lust, whether it's committed by male or female, is sin. Now, lust means the desire for an illicit relationship. Jesus explained that adultery actually begins in the heart, the heart that harbors lust. To simply avoid the act of adultery, but to have a mind that is filled with lustful thoughts and desires for someone else is to miss the point entirely of God's law. Amen. To be faithful to your spouse with your body, but not your mind, is to break the trust that is so vital to a strong marriage. Amen. It's a both end. Jesus was, was not condemning natural interest in the opposite sex, or even healthy sexual desire. These are God-given attributes. But the deliberate and the repeated filling of one's mind with fantasies that would be sin if they were acted out upon, that is what Jesus is condemning. Now, very often we view lust as just some really deviant desire that you see acted out in some degrading kind of a movie. But, but understand that we can lust in seemingly innocent ways. If you are married, have you ever imagined what it would be like to be in the arms of another man or woman? Have you daydreamed about having an intimate relationship with another man or woman? And I'm not just talking about physical intimacy, emotional intimacy. Do you daydream about what it would be like to be married to that man or that woman who's just so much more compassionate and understanding than your spouse is? will understand that you are lusting after that person. You are desiring something that if acted upon would be sin. And in fact, entertaining it in your mind is sin as well. Now, some of you may be thinking, Pastor, just, just knock it off. You're, you're making such a big deal about nothing. I mean, ultimately, who does it really hurt if I simply fantasize about someone or something? There's no harm done, no harm, no foul. It's just in my mind only. We argue that it's something just for us. And frankly, we deserve it because my situation is so hard and I need just a little bit of, of fantasy just to get away and, and just let my mind wander. And it doesn't really hurt anybody. It's just all right here. Now, admittedly, I'll admit this. Sinful action is more damaging to other people than sinful desire because it affects more than just the individual. If you act out on something, it affects other people. In this case, adultery, it destroys people, it destroys families. I'll grant you that. Nevertheless, sinful desire is just as damaging to our righteousness. Amen. Left unchecked, inappropriate desire will result in wrong actions. 
And this could be true for any inappropriate desire. If you just let it be, if you let it just stew in your mind and you chew on it and you kick it around, if you don't deal with it, if you leave it unchecked and you let it stay there, those inappropriate desires over time will result in wrong actions. We are not that strong to stand firm. They will hurt other people. They will turn people away from God. Private sins, as we sometimes refer to them, they have a fatal attraction by appearing to be internal only, hidden, secret. But Jesus declared lustful looks and thoughts and intentions are sin. You know, God is not bound by our privacy. He's not. Our thoughts, our emotions are as visible to him as our actions. He sees it all. From the divine perspective, those things are actions. And this in part explains their sinfulness. Lust, it also creates an offense before God by misusing one of his most powerful gifts, the capacity to reflect. I want you to think about this. The part of us most able to consider and appreciate our creator God, to meditate on his word, to think about his world and contemplate it, becomes increasingly toxic as we use that faculty to consider sin. Our mind, it becomes like a waste water, like a water source that after an oil spill, it's just filled with toxins and pollutants. Now, my guess is that every married person in this room, male and female, is on the hook right now at some point in their life. So what do we do? What do we do? Well, we have to take immediate, decisive action. Our response to sin and temptation in our heart and mind is crucial. And Jesus takes some time to discuss this. Listen to verses 29 and 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Wow. The bottom line is that we cannot tolerate and allow sin to fester and grow in our hearts. We can't. We can't leave it alone. It is a powerful force that will demolish you. It will destroy you over time. Amen. Sometimes we tol tolerate sins in our lives that, left unchecked, they will eventually destroy you. And it is better to experience the pain of removal, getting rid of a bad habit or something that we treasure, for instance, than to allow that sin to bring judgment and condemnation. You see, we must examine our lives for anything that causes us to sin and take every necessary action to remove it. That's what this is showing us. We need to examine, we need to see where is there sin that's causing things in our life to unravel, and we must be very deliberate and take every necessary action we can to remove it and cut it out. You know, I can remember an example in my own life. After I'd been a Christian for about a year or so, if you guys remember, I, I became a Christian at 17, my junior year in high school, and I'd been a Christian for about a year, and I was really convicted that the music that I listened to, it was causing me to stumble. It was not Christ honoring. It was not edifying. At the same time, I had invested a lot of money, a lot of time, and personal enjoyment in, in creating my music collection. However, I knew that if I did not do something to remove it from my life, I was setting myself up for temptation and sin. And I came to the point that I, I knew what I had to do. So I gathered up all of my music collection. Back then it was all my tapes, all my cassette tapes. And I threw them all out. Amen. Tossed them in the garbage. It was a very hard thing to do. But I am better off for having done it. Now Jesus, he gives a very alarming directive in verses 29 and 30. Understand that Jesus said that when Jesus said to get rid of your eye or your hand, he's speaking figuratively. He's making a point by an extreme. He didn't mean to literally gouge out your eye because even a blind person can lust. But if that were the only choice, it would be better to go into eternal life with one eye than to go to hell physically intact. 
Understand that if, if we were to cover up and cut off all of our senses, every single faculty that we have that way, we would still have our hearts and our minds to contend with. Amen. This strong language, it describes how Jesus' followers should renounce anything that would cause them to sin or turn away from the faith. We must take sin seriously and respond to it drastically by surgically removing it, if you will. It reminds me a little bit of a friend of ours from West Virginia back when we were living there. She was diagnosed with cancer in one of her breasts. And uh, the doctors were discussing various options with her that she uh, would be able to take care of it you know, from the least invasive to more. And, and she said, don't even mess around. Just take both sides completely. She wasn't going to mess around with it. She wouldn't leave any room for reoccurrence. Just get it all out of there. The action of surgically cutting sin out of our lives should be prompt and complete in order to keep us from sin. Believers must get rid of any relationship, practice, or activity that leads to sin. A person, they would submit to losing a diseased part of the body in order to save his or her life. In the same way, believers should cut off any temptation, habit, or part of their nature that could lead them away from Christ. Just cutting off a limb that committed sin or gouging out an eye that looked lusty would still not get rid of sin. Amen. Because sin begins in the hearts. It begins in the mind. Listen to James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 to sort of put this into perspective. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. People are saying, Jesus was saying that people need to take drastic action to keep themselves from stumbling. Self-denial is preferable to sin and its consequences. This is radical discipleship. While none of us will ever be completely free from sin until we get a new and glorified body, God wants an attitude that renounces sin instead of one that holds on to it. Unrestrained desire, inappropriate thoughts and desires, they are sin. It begins in the heart. And when entertained, it can lead to some very destructive consequences. And this then leads us to some very practical application when, when um, looking at sin. This is specifically in the area of adultery in our text today, but this really could be for any kind of desire or inappropriate thought. And I want to take a few moments to discuss six practical steps that we should all follow this morning when it comes to guarding our hearts and minds. And the first is this. Realize that inappropriate desire serves as an alarm. Inappropriate desire serves as an alarm. Whenever you have a desirous thought towards someone other than your spouse in this case, or something that's not honoring to God, realize that that is a huge alarm that's sounding. It's letting you know that you are entering dangerous waters, and you must reverse your course immediately. Do not continue on this same course, or you're really asking for trouble. I know in western Montana, you go rafting and tubing and stuff in the rivers, and it's a wonderful thing to do. And there's some, some dams and things that they have also in these, these rivers. And when you're on the river, there's signs as you're, you know, exit the water now. And then a little bit farther down, it's like, no, really, exit the water now. Dangerous waters ahead. And as you get even closer, there's a bell that's going off. It's letting you know if you don't get out, you're in big trouble. You're probably going to die. And so you're best off getting out like way back there because sometimes the rivers, if they're flowing fast, they're hard to get out of. So as soon as you see that sign, get to the shore, get out. In the same way, when you have an inappropriate desire going on, your heart and your mind's entertaining something, the alarm bell's going off. Hey, exit the water now before you get in real serious trouble. Second, recognize that you are vulnerable. Recognize that you are vulnerable. If you think that you are too strong to stumble in this area, then you're already ripe for a fall. Amen. Also, when you recognize it, that you are vulnerable, you will keep yourself clear from any potentially dangerous situations. Put protective barriers around you. Do not spend time one-on-one -on -one with somebody of the opposite sex who's not your spouse. 
Some people may think that that's hypersensitive, but I have seen too many godly men and women fall to think that I am not capable of the same thing. And understand that the same is true for every single one of you as well. Amen. We do not have the strength to withstand that in our flesh. Third, watch your input. Watch your input. If you are watching provocative movies, looking at suggestive magazines, listening to sexualized music or anything like that, you are walking through a minefield. I like sports as, next, as much as the next guy. But I'm telling you, a subscription to Sports Illustrated is not a good idea for any Christian man. Amen. There's that annual swimsuit issue that comes out and it will ruin you. Amen. It will. Subscribe to a different news source instead. Ladies, if you are reading books or watching movies that cause you to compare your husband to that, that, that perfect leading man and wishing that he were just as sensitive and compassionate and romantic, just like so-and-so, choose something else to watch and read. Amen. You are in for big trouble if you continue down that road. Next, we can help each other out by dressing thoughtfully. Dress thoughtfully. Clothing that shows off your figure in a suggestive way is unfair and a huge temptation to those around you. This goes for both men and women, boys and girls. And I know that this can make shopping difficult. Julie and I have raised one and a half daughters, if you would, through adolescence. Ingrid's an adult now, he has got three more years to go. Believe me, Julie can tell you how long it takes to find appropriate clothing. We can tell you the hours of enthralling conversation with our daughters about why we do things the way we do. We've been there, done that, we're continuing to do it. I get it. I am blown away by how sexualized girls' clothes have become. Shorts are literally that. Decent bathing suits are very hard to find. The rule at our house, I'm just telling you this is our rule at the Taylor household, is that all clothing must be modest and appropriate so as not to lead other people into temptation. This means that two-piece bathing suits, you don't do them. Amen. Not only is that hard to find decent one-piece bathing suits, but the culture and the peers around do not help at all. They don't. I remember a time when Ingrid was awarded a swimming trip for completing a reading program at school. This was a day for swimming and fun with all the other fellow students who qualified for the trip. And about a week before the trip, her friends, now I, I was asking Julie, and I'm pretty sure this is fourth grade, because I think it was the year before we moved here. So this is fourth grade, mind you, fourth grade. But the week before the trip, all the fourth grade girls we're out on the playground during recess talking about what bathing suits they would wear and how sexy they were. And Ingrid told them that she would be wearing a one-piece bathing suit because that was her parents' rule for her. For all of our kids, we always told them, if you get in a fine, just blame it on your parents. Amen. Hey, that's my parents' rule. Nothing I can do about it. Amen. They, they let her know. These friends of hers, during recess, let her know that she would never get a boy to like her if she didn't show off her body a little more. And the pressure went on for about a week. And we talked about it each night. We prayed about it. And he was very distraught. And then we had a good conversations because then she's mad at us about our stupid rules. And I mean, I, I, believe me, I've been there, done this. And on the day of the trip, these fourth grade girls, mind you, <laughs> brought a tiny little two-piece bathing suit for Ingrid to wear at the pool and said, your parents will never know. Man. Now, thankfully, according to Ingrid's account, she stood tall and strong in the face of this temptation, told them no. As a Christian, please make sure that you dress thoughtfully, appropriately, modestly for the sake of fellow believers around you. It's hard, but you do not want to cause somebody to stumble. Next, think consequences. Think consequences. Again, these are six very practical steps. 
I remind myself of the consequences that would come from entertaining an inappropriately desirous thought. I could lose everything. I could lose everything. And the same is true for you. We have all seen the consequences of those who lost everything because they could not control themselves. Families destroyed, careers lost, as well as reputation, and sometimes jail time served, depending on the, on the indiscretion. You can lose everything for a moment of passion. Is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? Realize also that the battle is lost well before the indiscretion occurs. In Proverbs, we see that the man who is lured away by the adulteress is like a lamb being led to slaughter. You could lose everything. Lastly, run away. Just run away. When inappropriate desire begins to infiltrate your mind, you have to flee the situation. If there's a relationship that is causing you to sin, get rid of it. Cut it out. If there are places that are causing you to stumble in your mind, don't go there. Just like Joseph, who was faced with temptation, we have to flee the scene immediately. Do not even hang around and entertain it. Don't dip your toe in the water. And God will give you the strength to do it. And then he will replace those things that you think you may be missing with even better things. Amen. Yes. There have been relationships in my life that I've had to cut out of my life, and it was hard. When I became a Christian at 17, I had to change my circle of friends. I had to change what I was doing. It was hard, but you know what? God gave me even better. And you may be thinking of that person or that relationship or that activity or that hobby, whatever it may be, that you're like, man, I like it so much, I don't know if I can get rid of it. If it's causing you to sin, get rid of it, and God will give you better Amen. every single time. Amen. Now, there's just two other quick things, just in terms of practicality, that I want to mention. So we have the six steps for avoiding this, but two just really quick things. First, this passage is not teaching that sexual desire itself is wrong. I don't want anybody to walk out of here with the wrong impression. That's not what this passage is teaching. God created it. He gave it to us as a wonderful um, thing to enjoy. And he also gave us a wonderful context to fulfill its desires. You know what it's called? Marriage. It's called marriage. Understand also that marriage is the only context in which we are to fulfill those desires. And while this passage is talking about sin that deals with those who are married, again, there are plenty of other passages that let us know very clearly that sexual relationships outside of marriage, even for those who are single, is not God-honoring. It's sin. Now, the other point is that for some today, and I understand this, and I want you to hear me well, for some today, the literal sin, the physical act of adultery, is a reality. Please know that there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ every single time. Amen. He is compassionate Amen. and merciful, and he yes. will forgive you. If you are engaged in that right now, stop it now. Recognize your sin. Recognize your inability. Come to Christ for grace and mercy and forgiveness and for the power that he will give you to help you stand firm. Jesus is the only one who can help you overcome your sin. Also, I want you to understand this very well. If this is a transgression for you in the past, something that has happened in your past, and you've confessed it, and you've repented of it, then you are forgiven. Amen. And do not allow the enemy to condemn you and beat yourself up over and over and over about it anymore. You are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. The new has come. You are forgiven. Remain complete in Christ. You have to hold on to that. Do not beat yourself up about the past. In closing today, let me say once again that inappropriate desire is sin. And sin begins in the hearts. And because of this, we must diligently work to rid ourselves of sin. And, and while we cannot be sinless until we are with Christ for eternity, we have to keep watch our thoughts, our motives, our attitudes, our temptations. And when we find a destructive habit or a thought pattern, we need to cut it. Cut it out and throw it away. 
understand also that it's only in Christ, our sanctifier, that we can have victory over these things. Church, if you try to do this in your strength and in the flesh, you're going to fail. Amen. But in Christ, you can have victory to overcome any temptation. Yes. And my prayer for each and every one of us is that we will become more and more like Jesus as he strips away those things in our lives that are not of him, replaces them with things that are all to his glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word. It's a hard word. One that we really sometimes don't want to think about. We just want to ignore it and it'll go away. But Lord, it doesn't. It doesn't go away. In fact, it continues to grow. And sin, if it's not taken care of, it'll metastasize. It'll consume us. It'll destroy us. And leave a wake of destruction in his path. Broken families, hurt people. That's what the enemy wants to do. And even as we sang here earlier, we're, we're going to tear the devil's kingdom down. We're yeah. not going to put up with this anymore. We can put a stake in the ground and say, enough. I belong to Christ. My family belongs to Christ. My mind belongs to Christ. My heart belongs to Christ. And I have power in Christ to withstand temptation. Any temptation. And we have victory. And we can overcome. In the name of Jesus, the devil has to flee. Every single time. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that we will hold firm to those truths. And we'll walk in victory and holiness and righteousness. Not because we're so grand, but because of Christ in us. Yes. That's what it's about. Praise and we say Lord. thank you in advance to all the things you're going to continue to do in this church, in our families, in our own hearts and minds. All to your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite the praise team up. Church, we're going to close just a tiny bit different in a way. There's a song. And, you know, I understand. I get it. It's a hard word today. It's a hard word. We get uncomfortable talking about these kinds of things. I understand, too. But you know what? We can't ignore them. We can't avoid them. It's real stuff. And um, I, one time before, I, I, I did this song just at the keyboard. But we're going to sing a benediction over each other. We're going to sing a prayer over each other. Because we need Christ to go before us. And so you can stand. You can sit. You can kneel. But what I want to do is I want to take this song. And I want to just sort of sing this over each other as a benediction, as a closing of our service together. And um, may this be what we walk out these doors with, this benedictory song, sung by each other and over each other, all to the Lord's glory. We're going to close this with the church.